Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this special episode of Voices of Color. Um, it's both timely and absolutely necessary that we have this episode in particular. Um, I wanted to do one earlier in the year during June, during Pride Month, or wait, but this can't. And so this, this is a special episode that we put together and everybody on here is being authentic and vulnerable and coming into the space heavy. Uh, so do know that this is difficult work, difficult space to live in and to experience every day, but necessary to share. So for those of you that are new to the show, Voices of Color is a space for uh, Skidians of Color to come and share their experiences about what happens beyond the gate. When we take off our garb, we do not stop being people of color. Um, this is a way for us to share our stories, to validate each other, hopefully educate some folks in the process. Um, and tonight is especially important when we start talking about, even though I don't like the term allies, what allies can do for this community that is experiencing grief and harm, oppression, and it's really visible right now. So before we begin, I want to do the uh, normal disclaimer. Voices of Color is not endorsed by or affiliated with Society for Creative Anachronism Incorporated. The views of the hosts and guests do not represent the views, values, or policies of SCA Inc. And again, this really is because we're coming into this space, not as Scadians, but as people who are involved in the SCA. But this is us. This is us beyond the gate. And we don't stop being people of color. Tonight's episode, we are doing an intersectionality episode, um, and we'll talk a little bit about why this is important and timely. But first, I want to introduce the panel and uh, panel members, if you would introduce yourself. I guess I should introduce myself first. My name is Nina. I go by Jean Viev in the society, uh, in the SCA. I identify as a queer woman of color. Um, and coming into the space as a queer woman of color. All right, panel members, who are you? Um, <clears throat> my name is Sam, well, I'm, uh, Sa go by Samson Muscovich or Sammy in the SCA. Uh, my real name is Milan. I am a uh, trans masculine person of color and that's who I am. Uh, I am Silenus uh, in the mundane world. I go by Hector. Uh, I am a queer man of color. My pronouns are he, they. Um, and that's who I am. Oh, Latino. Oh, I'll go. Uh, I am Jessica. I'm Zara in the society. Um, and I am a queer black woman. I'm mirror in the SCA and in real life. <laughs> Tvorim and Danilov in the SCA. Uh, I am First Nations. I am Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians descent and um intersex, so I would call myself X to him. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining tonight, especially as, you know, we have a lot going on in life. Um, this show, again, is a difficult one, but necessary. And it's going to be hopefully enlightening for some folks. Um, as members of the LGBTQIA2S plus community, as well as people of color, um, you know, there are some intersections that often don't get covered. So a lot of the panels uh, of LGBTQIA2S plus Skadians that I've seen have not directly addressed what it's like to be a queer person of color. And I use queer as an umbrella term, um, not everybody identifies with that term, um, but it doesn't get talked about. Um, so in part, you know, bringing visibility, but right now with things that are happening 
in the United States, around the world, it is really important to highlight some of this intersectionality. Um, for my panel members, what brings you here today? Mm. I, when I, uh, there was uh, an attack in Colorado and uh, it was really bad. Five people passed away. And uh, in order to kind of move forward with a lot of my SCA responsibilities and things, I had to kind of pack it in a box, put it on a shelf, and keep moving forward. <clears throat> There's just so much going on in the world that I was like, nope. You know, and I just thought this was the most appropriate place to finally really talk about it, uh, other than privately with my partner. Um, uh, with other people who get it. Absolutely, thank you. <clears throat> I had to kind of hit it nose on. I woke up that Sunday morning to the news, the attack. And I'm an ecumenical Catholic priest, so I was already doing a trans day of remembrance as our intention for mass, and then going off to a trans day of remembrance service that evening and messaging the other people leading the service saying, we need to pivot to anybody who needs a vigil for what just happened at Q Club. And it made The plan was that I was going to read all 322 names, which then turned into 390 names. And on top of all of it, it was heavy. It was really heavy. And I feel like I've just kind of had to hit the ground running and everything that's been going on since then has been like hitting while I'm still running on everything else. And I haven't had a chance to sit with any. Mm -hmm. Milan. It is really difficult to con to walk the constant barrage against the queer community. And especially when, you know, like you had mentioned earlier, you know, the intersectionality of being queer people of color is rarely talked about. It's like, you know, as people of color, we've been under attack all our lives basically, especially if we're in predominantly white spaces. And this is just one more thing that adds to the pile. And <laughs> it's just gotten to be like, you know, Mira and Selena said, like it's it's become a lot because we're still trying to move on and forward with our lives and try to be beacons of hope for our community. But it's hard to bear that weight. I think that uh, the SCA struggles with um, understanding intersectionality in a very practical way. Um, I think it's easy to say that, hey, as a queer Black woman, I face racism and sexism and homophobia. However, people don't understand that these things aren't additive. They are often multiplicative, exponentially so, right? It is, it is not if you address one, the other goes away, but rather being at the junction of more than one kind of oppression usually leads you to even having less of a voice or less of a platform um, than any of the others. And it gets ignored a lot. I've had people directly kind of talk to me about the work that I've done within DEI uh, with the perspective that I did it primarily only for communities of color. I've had people suggest to me like, well, we should have a representative on her who has experience in like the gay community. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> uh, and it's very interesting to kind of, and I say interesting, it is not good interesting, but it is very difficult to kind of have aspects of your identity erased 
in terms of um, platform and understanding, uh, but still be living that very real day-to-day -day fear and immediacy of fear. Um, and I don't think that the SCA does a particularly good job of understanding that even within DEI-oriented communities, I think that that gets overlooked a lot. And for those of you watching, um, if you don't know, you know, within oppressed communities, you also have, and not to play the oppression Olympics, but you have communities within communities that are even further marginalized and further harmed by inequities and oppression. So statistically looking at um, the, uh, I'm going to, um, working with, I work with transgender um, people in my job. And statistically, people of color that also identify as transgender are at higher risk of being victims than white uh, people who identify as transgender. So that's really what Jessica means by, you know, it's not just an addition. When you have that intersectionality, you, you view from very different lenses. So I can hide my queer identity if I chose um, and, and have for some time, but when it comes to being a person of color, that doesn't change. So then you add on or you know multiply that by being a queer person of color in a nation where you are you know, not wanted, facing harm when you leave your front door, it's a lot to take in. So some of you alluded to the shooting in, at, at Club Q, um, which for a lot of us brought back memories of Pulse and the yeah. shooting at Pulse nightclub. I know that for me, it, it felt like it was back there. I, uh, I had a really, it's interesting that you brought up Pulse because if I'm being real talk, completely honest, I heard about Club Q. I heard five people. My first reaction was, <laughs> that's awful. My next reaction, and this is speaking as a Latino queer person who had to deal with Pulse, I was relieved. Oh, thank goodness. Only five people died this time. It's not as bad as Pulse. And that is how I have been able to compartmentalize this up until like tonight, <laughs> just cause um, it was just so big. Yeah. It's like um, the only person I've ever seen put it into words was there was an interview uh, on gaycation. They did a special Miami episode, Elliot Page's old documentary where he used to go all over the world to different queer communities globally. And they did something similar to what we we're doing today. They packed up all their stuff. They went to Miami and they just, they wanted to be there. They had to be there. It was important, even though it was hard. And one of them said, so many, we lost so many. But how bad has it gotten that I was relieved only five people died? <clears throat> That's not how I mean, anybody should feel. <laughs> it's it's terrifying because you create these spaces, right? You create these spaces of safety where you feel like you can be yourself very openly after often a lifetime of not being able to do so. And you create community within those spaces. Uh, and then all of these attacks, and this is awful and terrible, but it is the latest in a long line. Uh, they just remind you that there is no safe space. Uh, because as long as you try to exist as a microcosm within a larger problematic society, you are always at risk. Uh, and that's really hard because you can't go through life without trying to form that community. Mm -hmm. So there's always going to be that tension and there's always going to be that underlying discomfort. And that alertness that we have to have to it. Um, I went to Utrecht, which is kind of the a real source of knowledge for my my brand of Catholicism. And going to school every day for that that summer session I was there for, 
I crossed a square that was the Cathedral Square of Utrecht. And there was a memorial set in the, the cobblestones that I walked past every day. And I had to stop in honor every day where a part of the cathedral had apparently fallen down and queers had gathered into this little sheltered area and then some disease had hit Utrecht and they went and they burned the queers. And there's this, this just, you know, and people walking right over it like it's nothing. And that stone loomed so large to me and so small to everybody else. And that's, that's our reality. Only with each of us, we've got five or six different stones that are just huge to us. I once tried to explain to someone when we're talking about, you know, personal identity and groups that experience oppression, historic, current, that we're all given these cups, right? And for some people, there are holes in the cup and you're trying to keep water in. And the more intersectionality that you have with a, a groups of oppression, right? This cup has more holes. And it really, it, it more speaks to the ability to, um, you know, exist in a safe spaces, exist in self-preservation and taking care of self, but that when people see at the end of the day, you know, maybe they see an incident that happened. I'll just use myself for an example. They see an incident that happens and I get really upset uh, because it's one incident in the 50 that happened over the course of the day. And so we carry that and those incidents don't go away. So, you know, again, for our viewers, we have the, the experiences of people of color, we have the experiences of being queer. You may see one incident, but there are so many. And because of that, then this is where I, I think we really, when we're talking about relief over, you know, that it was only five communities that are impacted and harmed again and again and again, we start to be, almost become immune to seeing the news and seeing black and brown bodies on the news. Um, which people, remember, mis cause, oh, which people mistake for innate resilience right. all the time. Uh, it's <laughs> right. the whole like, oh, <clears throat> black and brown people are so strong. When you beat us, like economically, socially, physically, on a daily basis, we're going to harden. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just really felt what you were saying. No, please. It, it, and the only reason, I, the reason I wanted to amplify this is because Twelfth Night is coming up. And here in Ontario, we had the incident where a Black man was approached in a hotel where we were going to have Twelfth Night. And there was a whole incident that happened. And for me, it was a, oh, well, they didn't shoot him. Moving on. And that is what we have Ooh. to do. So helping people understand <sighs> why we have that reaction at times where we know and have in the back of our minds, it could be worse. Yeah. And so I think that's, that's really what you were speaking to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, Jess and I used to live in the same kingdom. I'm actually now in North Shield. Um, mm. But I mean, there's a time when speaking of like, you know, having, you know, pretty much having to have your head on a swivel. I was driving to an event in central Illinois and I almost got ran off the road. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, watched a big pickup truck just roll past me. And I'm just like, what the hell are you doing? Oh, right. I've got stickers identifying myself as being queer. I have to and, remind, uh, yeah, I uh, just, I was going to say, I have to remind myself where Gulf Wars is every year. Gulf Wars is on my no-fly zone for a reason. And all of my white SCA friends think I'm crazy. Except for my people in my household. <laughs> like, you know, I've, they get you know it. I've, actually, I've had to have that conversation with some of our folks at North Shield where it's, you know, they're asking me, like, why aren't you going to an event? Um, 
have you looked at me recently? I'm black. I, you know, there are some places I, I am willing to drive and I'm willing to take on that risk. But there's a lot of them where I'm just like, I'm going into the backwoods of Minnesota or I'm going into the backwoods of Wisconsin. I don't think so. Because my safety comes at a price. And it's like, I, I can't justify that for my hobby. Yeah. And having that knowledge is so important. Um, I had to fish my eyebrows back out of, of what's left of my hairline. Um, last spring, I had a, a new coworker coming in. Yeah, I'm going to visit all the little towns. And I'll be like, no, you're not. We, we sweetie. Because, uh, <laughs> and I don't know where she came from. But I'm looking at this African-American lady thinking, no, no, none of the small towns in the Pacific Northwest. No. Mm-mm. No, mm-hmm. no, no. You can go to this one. Okay. You can go to that one if you've got friends. And and I don't know how she survived to pretty much my age with without that sense that small town bad. But the people who come to the Northwest and don't know that a lot of people left the South after the Civil War. And there were some fascinating little enclaves. Well, and there's a lot of misconception about the Pacific Northwest, uh, about us being liberal and hippies and this and this and that. The reality is the history of racism in Oregon is atrocious. It was settled as and advertised as a white utopia. So yep. most people don't yep. know that. So then they don't know the history of redlining, sundown yep. towns, which still exist. Um, and, and, and it's amazing because I, t- I teach that at, at work. Um, and most people who have lived in Oregon their entire lives have absolutely no clue. And I'm like, you need to know this because Portland and things like Portlandia, mm. that's mm-hmm. what people expect to see uh but even then it's it's the northwest nice yeah I went I visited Portland I did like a week-long trip because I was thinking oh another big population center maybe I'll live here I heard nothing but good things I went to visit my best friend and it was painfully white yeah I did not like it I did not like it at all I'm not used to not seeing Latino people and brown because I live in San Diego, right near the Mexican border. There's plenty of Latino people. It took me a few years to figure out where the black people in San Diego County lived because they kept migrating because of gentrification from one neighborhood to another. Uh, I actually had to ask uh, an Uber driver once. I was just like, so I have a question. Where do the black people in San Diego live? Because I see, I was seeing nothing but Asian people, whites, and Latinos. And I was like, am I living in the wrong neighborhood? Um, but eventually I figured out where they were. And it was just, I just, Portland was nothing like that. Mm-hmm. They just, it just, it was weird. And I didn't, I liked everything else about it. Mm-hmm. But that one thing. And I also knew the history of Oregon. And I was like, I don't. I don't feel like this place is safe or my safety would come at the cost of being exotic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, even, so we went to, um, on tier West door and it was me and a group of folks who were all white and we just stopped for breakfast somewhere in nowhere, Oregon. And I'm like, Oh, okay. And we got approached by someone who, was very much making kind of racial, racially motivated comments to me, asking about where I was from and whatnot. When I said Chicago, they were like, oh, how's the crime? I'm like, (laughs) and to me, these kind of, these series of questions, they're funny, right? Because if I allow myself to be so raw as to hear and internalize the constant barrage of racism just on a daily basis what what kind of a life do I lead right I'd just be forever upset the people I was with were astounded that I was brushing it off and joking about it and just kind of being like "Eh." 
Um, and it was serious, but I also kind of wanted to be like, this is my every day. Like okay. this is this is maybe a funnier situation, but like this, these kinds of comments, the looks, I mean, I'm sorry, you're just noticing it and I'm not trying to minimize how bad it is, but like for me, <laughs> this is every day. So I have to find a way to live with that. And I think everyone kind of does find the way to live with that, whether it is laughing it off or insulating themselves or ignoring it or whatever else. Um, and there is a danger there that people outside of those communities think it's not that big a deal. It doesn't happen mm -hmm. when I'm like, hey, this is survival. Mm -hmm. yeah. Everything can't be for the yeah. external benefit of understanding. Yeah. I need to get uh, them today. Because the it's, thing is, they do know because they say stuff to me because I pass. Oh, and, I pass. Oh, mm. So I'm the gift the of passing agent occasionally. Mirror. There's there's decades of jokes about secret agent mirror, and it gives me this position where I can look at the white community and say, I know what's been said to me. I'm pretty sure it's been said to you, and it didn't matter. It matters now. What'd you say? What'd you do? Mm -hmm. And it's kind of ironic, especially now that I'm passing this while male, because I visually am the least safe demographic. And I've been wrapping my head around that. That I look like a white straight male. We went, um, I was in, in St. Louis at the time of Pride, and it was like, oh, I could go to Pride. And nobody knows me. And I'm with my wife, and we look like a het couple. We looked like a white head couple. And the more trans stuff I grabbed, I looked like dad of the year. I didn't look like a trans guy. I didn't look like the community. Mm -hmm. So there's there's that thing. And it means that I can be the white person going with you to provide that little white face. But it also means I can call them on the stuff that they have heard. It just yeah. wasn't important. On, on the flip side, though, there's also the, and I don't know if anybody else experiences this, I am, you know, obviously a person of color. I don't get mistaken for white. I don't think ever. However, people don't always know I'm queer. And mm -hmm. so they will make the oh. comments <laughs> that are homophobic, transphobic, uh -huh. what have you, uh -huh. because no. they don't know. And so, yeah. so Mir, even when you're saying that, I, I'm like, what you must, you, you must have it, those experiences where someone says something about people of color, if mm -hmm. they don't think that you are a person of color, right? Like there's that flip side of it. Has anyone else experienced that? I'm uh, guessing based on the noises that were just made. Just like the, there's a certain uh, casual homophobia that gets thrown around in the machismo uh latino culture uh i'm 42 i don't have time to be like popping off about it anymore like so it kind of rolls off my back now um but i'm not dumb like you know and just sometimes you'll go to the barber shop or something and if they don't know they don't know and they'll make these comments and i'm just like mm, you know yeah uh uh my favorite thing is to um uh shut down people's homophobia when they try and like what's one one was like there's this one guy at work because i work in a restaurant and made an inappropriate comment about uh isn't the best time when you're soaping up another dude's butt and i just looked him dead in the eye uh, and he was trying to make all of the homophobic like cooks and servers uncomfortable because he's like edgy. And I like leaned in and I was like, yep, it's my favorite part. Mm -hmm. I don't want to dark on anybody to HR. Not, you know, 
especially in a restaurant environment, which is bad, by the way. I just want to say I have studied the sociological statistics in school on how much more permissible like sexual harassment and that kind of mm -hmm. behavior is in the restaurant industry. Um, but I need to make money and I don't want to make waves at my job. I'm like a working class person, you know, and see, that's the thing. We have to like compromise our own integrity almost on a daily basis just to survive. Yeah, that's safety yeah. math. You got to check. Who are, you, who are your people? Do you have allies? Is this a time when you can respond or is it a time when you better let it slide? We're always mm -hmm. running that math. And that's the irony is that I come into a room and I see other people of color, I'm like, but they don't know that about me. And it's just, it's, yeah. Getting back to the intersectionality, um, again, we kind of talk about not noticing that it's multiplicative, right? So yeah. as a person who identifies as bi, right, between bi erasure entirely, or the commodification of bi women for the consumption of often a straight male gaze, there's something very dehumanizing and invalidating about this kind of fundamental aspect of my identity. And I kind of don't know when and how to present it to avoid falling into those kinds of uncomfortable discussions and conversations. Um, it, and sometimes like, over the years, when you're navigating the SCA as a white majority space, any kind of sort of uh, like romantic interactions and such, sometimes you worry when you're at war and you're flirting with somebody, am I their fetish? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, the fetish. Both as a queer person, you know? <laughs> both and as a person of color, like, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's really it's one of the reasons like I'm really really trying to lean in to my heathenness I understand that I don't owe anybody androgyny um but it's like oh the things people say uh real and imagined you know no it's exhausting and you know I'm just trying to have a good time I'm not trying to be baby's first black girl like I'm not <laughs> here to always be in the role of educator and, and uh, adventure guide as you discover how to appropriately interact with new communities I, you knew exactly what i was talking about right at the heart of the battle like well it's like kind of like even what jazz was saying like i get the like you know bbc comments and i'm just like let me break this down for you like you know <laughs> yeah because i i've mm, thankfully not so much in the sca because i don't really put myself out in that space but in other spaces i have gotten the like well let me you know show me your you know show me your tool and i'm just like i can grab the one that's out of my drawer but it's just like but it's that whole like it's that and then it turns into the whole like you know trans fetish fetishization stuff and it's just like can we not because no and it's like i don't do chasers i don't you know no it's like i don't i want to be approached as a human the same way that you would approach someone else you know mm -hmm. don't approach because i'm exotic because i'm black or because i'm trans give me the same due respect that you give, give to the mediocre white dude thinking which we should get back to the bi part yeah yeah but well I, I i was thinking more about we talked about sites and you know it's it can you can feel if you're in a sun downtown or you can you can you can drive through a place and be like lock the motherfucking doors mm -hmm. uh go the speed limit please don't get pulled over right yep. or call home and make sure they have bail money but the one thing mm -hmm. that I don't think people, uh, when it comes to intersectionality, you do that check because again, like I'm, a, I'm obviously a woman of color. I need to do that check first, but then it's the, okay, so are they queer friendly? 
Uh because I've been to places like there was a place in Oregon we went I my uh, partner and I went to and I knew it was we'd been there before I knew it was fine to Mm -hmm. you know I wasn't worried about being a person of color but I went to go hold her hand and she's like we can't do that here and it's that it's that second so one I was like well well, what you know because you think it's going to be safe or Part of me wants to say if it's safe for one, it's safe for the other. Mm-hmm. And that's not the case. It's absolutely not the case. Mm-hmm. And so when when I think about events, that also goes through my mind is, okay, is it friendly for me as a pe- person of color? Next question, is it friendly for me as a queer woman of color? Mm-hmm. And they're not always the same answer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, usually the opposite answer for me. Yeah. I sometimes wonder, worry that, and this is, this is very specifically a queer person of color concern, is we sit down and we have conversations about having more black and brown people getting involved in the SCA. Are they going to bring their institutional homophobia with them? Right. Yeah. And I don't know if I want to deal with the homophobia that I get from other black and brown people and the homophobia I get from white people in the SCA pure mm-hmm. unfiltered all the time with no escape from any of the homophobia I have to deal with in my life and Excuse that's me, what queer phobia. is like I can't like I just and I, and I want to help but it just I and, and you can see it reflective in like a lot I've noticed and a lot of the DEI work is very queer inclusive and has been you know, you've been, Jessica, like, you've been very good about kind of directing people and then the people you talk to kind of keeping it so that none of that homophobia from Black and Brown communities or at least mitigating it. But it's still a, a worry um, because it's like, and then in other nerd communities, because I do gaming and 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 things, mm-hmm. there's it's it's not a day on Twitter goes by that um, a I I get in these like situations where I don't know who to side with. You know, we talked about oppression Olympics, and then there's just like, okay, well, there's this huge argument in the D and D space, for example. Do I side with the leftist uh, white trans woman? Um, or do I side with the gay black man that plays D and D? Because they're both screaming at each other. Mm-hmm. It was like when Lana Wasowski was like, "Well, the reason why Prop Eight passed was because church going black people voted for Obama." So the. The phenomenon that everyone here, I'm sure, is very familiar with of being uh, one of the few members of a marginalized community in a DEI space is that you get tokenized to being the representative for that space, right? (laughs) And in something like the SCA, where there are so few people of color, um, there's a very real fear to giving people a platform for potentially really problematic views. Um, Josh just pointed out in the comments, uh, the phobias within the LGBTQ community, right? Mm -hmm. Biphobia, transphobia, all of these things exist within within communities of people who ostensibly will be speaking from the same platform. Uh, And in something like the SCA, where there's so few to begin with, uh, I am very concerned about people learning the wrong thing, about people getting information from places that are full of bias, that are, that are problematic and exclusionary in many ways. Um, I know plenty of people in the SCA who identify as a member of a marginalized group who hold and espouse problematic opinions. So that is, that is a very real concern and fear that I have. No, yeah, it's it, it's it's rough, you know. Some um, 
uh, the insightful things by some of the older guests that are on the show. But sometimes some of the older guests are like, I'm like, Ugh. and I and I try to be active in the chat. I hope you appreciate that. Where I'm oh, like, hey, we don't say that anymore. Come on now. You know, <laughs> I, I try to like approach it like we're at the barbecue, right? Like, hey, you know, because I, I felt something for every interview I've watched. I've watched about 80% of the show. Um, and I've, and I've felt something fundamentally as a fellow skating with everybody, but there's sometimes it's just like, Hey, let's not, let's not do that. Like, you know, we've got to push forward. We got to deal with enough of that outside of the SCA. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of kind of problematic viewpoints that arise from, I don't want to say valid because I don't want to validate where it's going. <laughs> let's let's take it out of uh, an emotionally tense place and look at um, distrust of the medical community within basically all communities of color, right? Yeah, that totally was so just- Totally founded. So absolutely, a hundred percent totally founded. Our communities have been absolutely destroyed by a variety of different experimentation. Um, when they went to Puerto Rico and gave women birth control with estrogen that was too high, when they forcibly sterilized oh. indigenous women, when they, I mean, a million things, right? I could, I could talk mm -hmm. for hours. So many, like. But that, does that make it okay that so many people of color were like, I'm not getting a vaccine for COVID. I don't trust this institution, right? I got it's complicated. I got completely caught off guard because I thought, oh, surely all the people that I'm not, I'm connected to, whether socially or parasocially, as in like through social media and such. Yeah, uh, yeah, I've curated my circle, but no, there was this very lovely uh, uh, young black woman on uh, that I followed on TikTok through uh, pagan cosplayer nerdy things and I was like yes I've curated and but she got very very sick and talked about how she had COVID and then she's like I know you all told me you know that I should get vaccinated but you've just got to understand everything that's happened to our community and I know I'm paying for it now but like I was really afraid and I was like oh no like like even the nice ones like people are frightened, they're they're acting on their trauma, and it's like, mm -hmm. it's. Uh, but that's also that's also because of the way the government handled the situation. We didn't oh, yes, see, oh. I mean, for many reasons, but I'm going to highlight, especially here in Oregon, something that took a little bit for people to realize is that if you're asking a, 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 a community that is historically oppressed to do something, it better be coming from a member of that community. So it took the numbers of people of color dying at higher rates mm -hmm. for people to say, oh, maybe we should have doctors of color, nurses of color, you know, uh, all of these folks of color coming to talk to the communities. Maybe we should go to the community centers. Maybe we should go to the churches and have the people that they trust making those, uh, doing that outreach, doing that communication. Um, I'm convinced but, that that's how Puerto Rico got to 90% vaccination. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And we was, know that, that, is, that is statistically what it shows. I think mm -hmm. the bigger problem is when we have, when we were previously talking about being a member of a historically oppressed group and being the oppressor in the same lens. So one, nothing infuriates me more. But when you think about historically, the closer you could be to the oppressors, the safer you were. Mm -hmm. It's always better to point fingers at someone else to take the attention off of yourself, right? So sometimes I have to ground myself in that and remember, now that doesn't mean all walks of life can't be assholes because I've met people of color who are just assholes and ruin it for everyone. But <laughs> outside of that, like there is historically grounded reasoning behind some of these behaviors that we see. And it's as much as I want to be like, gosh, why wouldn't you take the vaccine? Come on now, like this is, at the same time, 
we have to remember the experimentation and all of these other pieces. Mm -hmm. But it's so harmful to the rest of us, right? It's harmful to the communities, but there's there is something behind it. Yeah, I can't think of a better example of how community trauma can manifest in kind of furthering your own issues. And I can't, I I mean, when I say I can't fault, I very loudly faulted these people for making sure it's not to get vaccinated. Yeah. But their fear is founded. Their fear continues to be founded. Mm -hmm. I have experienced many times going to the doctor and dealing with being dismissed. I'm not surprised that people with those same experiences looked at the medical community and said, oh, no, 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 that's not going to be me. I'm not surprised. I'm disappointed. Yeah, I'm not surprised. And uh, at least in, in my world, in the intersection of mental health and DEI, we're now, and it's psychiatry and medicine are just now starting to explore, I'm going to say, accept the fact that different cultural backgrounds react differently to medications. Mm -hmm. And that is not something that's openly talked about, at least in my experience. Um, I have had one person even speak to me about that uh, in my entire life about, you know, hey, you're, uh, you identify as Black people from, uh, uh, you know, uh, Uh, communities of color tend to be affected in this way versus people who are white. Like that's, I mean, that is another level of this, you know, the oppression. So we have the fear in that's really historically based in trauma. And then you just have the fact that, you know, people just don't know and don't think about it because they're white or they're cis or they're straight or what have you. Similar to, you know, um, what was the other piece? Um, People not thinking about skin cancer Mm -hmm. on people of color. It looks differently. And because people are not trained to recognize it, people of color are diagnosed way later in the state, in the course of stages and have a higher uh, um, mortality rate because doctors aren't trained in it. And so there's like, you know, when we talk about systems of oppression, and for those of you who are watching, I hope you're like listening to this and really understanding it's there's the historical roots that continue today because these systems are run by people who have historically and, and in most cases continue to have the power continue to have the privilege, continue to have these areas. So again, as a, you know, as queer people of color, uh, there's, there's so many different ways. And sometimes having to choose one identity over the other for reasons of safety mm-hmm. is necessary, but God damn, it sucks. Mm-hmm. And, and, and like, it's I, impossible. I, I, I just, you know, I didn't, you know, I have, been kind of on the offensive with like kind of DEI stuff and intersectionality in the ACA. Uh, my household has, we've got this really cool hand painted silk banner that we put outside of our encampment that is the, in this household, we believe that, you know, uh, yeah. Black Lives Matter of trans, tr- you know, trans people are valid, you know, and uh I experienced my first pushback at Great Western War this year. Let me just share this. Uh, I'm walking, minding my own business, and I look and at a sign outside an encampment I know that I've gone to many times and drinking at many times, and it said politics free zone. Violate this policy and you will be asked to leave. And then I, I saw then I saw whose camp it was. And then it turned out to be some of my queer bardic friends. Yes, they were white. No. <laughs> I confronted them at merchants about it because I almost ripped that sign down and yeeted it into the fucking lake. 
one of the things that I, I almost think- called you, Jessica. <laughs> like that is how mad I was when I saw that thing. I'm sorry, girl. I I know you just stepped out. I don't think you had stepped out yet in October, but I was hot. Uh, I did not do those things, but I did confront my friend and they said, um, I don't like it either. Myself and several other people in the camp tried to talk them out of it. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna take a step back. Because I've heard so much white nonsense over the years, I could guess what their justification was. And I said, let me guess, was it because they don't want a bunch of right-wing Trumpers coming in and saying a whole bunch of angry stuff and ruining the vibe of the bardic circle? She's like, yes. And I'm like, that's not what that sign says. My identities are not political. I'm going to counter you on that. Our very existence is political. Oh, yeah, right, right, exactly. You know what? You are correct, which is why that sign pretty much says that I'm not welcome in their camp. I, one of the things I talk about personally is that, I, and I've gotten pushback from both the queer community and the Black community on, is that I don't have an appropriate level of activism. Part of it was for a while my job. I w- I'm a former 911 dispatcher for five and a half years. I couldn't be involved in going to protests and things because if I was there and things escalated and I was arrested, I lose my job. Um, but the very fact that I can, I have the privilege of being out and being able to speak openly about my experiences, both as a person of color and also somebody who's trans. That is my form of activism. My, you know, my existence is political. I will happily talk with people about my personal experiences, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to go out and do much more than that. I'm happy to be a mentor. I'm happy to be a sounding board. And that for me is where my energy goes. Mm -hmm. I remember. I'm going to both agree and disagree, I think. Sorry, Nina, you want to go ahead? No, I was just, I, I remember a comment that I saw, um, I, and I don't remember what it was in regards to people of color, I'll just say in general. Um, and someone said, you know, I'm at this protest and there aren't any people of color. And I'm like, uh, bitch, because we know better. Because if I go, I'm an easy target. Yep. Who do you think they're going to shoot first, right? Yep. Like, it's going to be our I'm black sorry. asses. That and I love that y'all are marching. What else are you doing? Because yep. God damn it, I leave it every time I I live this every time I mm-hmm. open my eyes. Yep. Do not tell me how to uh, advocate for my people or my identity or what have you. Like that is bullshit. You cannot tell a community how they should or should not be doing something. Mm-hmm. Like mind your business. Sorry, I will step down now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, I... I really struggle. And that's why I say I both agree and I disagree, but it's out of an anger, right? Absolutely. Our existences have been politicized. Yeah. But it's such a slap in the face to be told, don't bring your politics here. You made it politics. Mm -hmm. I was just trying to live. And I accept that it has turned into this because of the majority viewpoint. But goddamn, if I'm not resentful as a motherfucker about it. It's right. So I just want to go and have fun. Yeah. And here's the thing. Mm-hmm. I've gone to that camp every single Great Western I had been to, gotten drunk, had a great time, sang songs. I didn't spend one minute in that camp the entire event. Yeah. And like that was one of the uh that encampment was one of the events where almost all of the big names in the Bardic community were hanging out. But you know what? I'd rather be with my partners back in my camp than in a bardic circle where my existence is political. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing that we just, we have so much trouble getting people to hear. Um, Out of my community, to to blow things in church zone for a sec, there's like, there's a huge uh, Latin community in California. 
-hmm. And the rates of how many of us were burying how many people mm -hmm. was really distinctly different. Mm -hmm. And so we had this cluster of clergy just traumatized. And this other larger group of clergy who thought they were traumatized, but and, and were at their level, but had no idea, no space for how much more trauma comes with just the daily grind of our communities and our vulnerabilities, all the healthcare stuff that happens. You know, Marilyn, we know this. We get our trans mm -hmm. stuff. And we get our color stuff mm -hmm. and, and all of our health level is down and all of it affects and they just don't see. Yep. People don't understand how the systems yeah. of oppression work together, yep. right? Mm -hmm. Again, we come back to people don't really understand intersectionality. They right. get it, but they don't. Mm -hmm. The medical community is, it's the easiest thing to talk about because it's the most concrete thing, right? We all experience it. Yeah. We all have <laughs> access to these histories that we can point to. I've told people multiple times, I hate going to doctors. And everyone's like, ah, and everyone hates the doctor. And I'm like, no. yeah, but as a woman whose pain gets dismissed and as a black person whose pain gets dismissed, I'm basically Deadpool to these motherfuckers. They don't give a shit how I feel. They think I'm going to be fine. The number of times I've gone in and been like, this is debilitating. I need you to take this seriously and had to advocate for myself. The number of times I have used the phrase, please note in my chart that you refuse to do that test, which by the way, everyone should keep that in their back pocket because mm -hmm. it is the only way to force these people to take you seriously is to yep. put them directly on the hook for negligence. Oof. Make mm. them note that they are refusing to treat you. I yeah. mean, it's just ridiculous. And there's so many people who don't know to do that because they've never been taught to. I mean, and then we just see this kind of repetitive, mm. recursive, negative relationship between communities of color and health, mental health, how much distrust is there? How many times do communities of color say like, ah, you just get over that. Mm -hmm. That's not like a thing. You don't go see the crazy doctor. Go to church. It's all founded or, on problematic things. The go to church or- That we're or in a, best, a worse place, you know? Or the, or the mental health component is treated as a punishment. Cause I got yeah. that one when I was younger. Oh, you're depressed? Let me go put you over on the psych ward. Well, the professional communities haven't done anything to address the history. So you still, I, again, my, that's, this is the intersection I live at. The, they've done studies where they've asked medical doctors, where they've asked med students about um, uh, people of color and pain, specifically black people of color and pain. And there's still the, the belief that black people have thicker skin. Yep. You have in the mental health and psychiatric, you know, fields, there's uh, evidence, there's a lot of evidence and studies that have been done about the prevalence of certain diagnoses over others, mm -hmm. criminal responsibility, like that stuff, even though these groups are putting out these statements, like we recognize, which let me tell you, I've read them, they're bullshit, but uh, <laughs> there's nothing being done to like, intentionally put into curriculum like for for medical students you may have the thought that you know people of color have thicker skin people of color have a higher pain threshold xyz and guess what you're wrong and maybe you should rethink becoming a doctor Oof. Uh, but that doesn't happen because studies i mean these studies are recent too yeah. Yeah. And until until people start talking up, like nothing is going to change because they're not listening to the communities. They're they're sure as hell not listening to us. Yep. Yeah. 
and it's 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 kind of the the same way I start to feel about change and how that needs to happen. Like, yeah. there's only so many times that people of color can say it, and we're all tired. Mm-hmm. So as as queer people, as uh, trans people, bi people, like people of color, we're fucking tired, right? We go we go through it day in and day out. It is time for the the dominant cultures, whoever it may be, to step up and do the thing. Mm-hmm. Like we're tired. Then you have something like the shooting in Colorado, which brings up so much trauma on top of all of these other things. Like we are fucking tired for people watching the show. I just, yeah, I want to share this because I know I had said I had put it on the shelf except for me and my partner. And I just want to share this with you and everybody because it could be any of us. I was with my partner. We're sitting there. I'm looking through social media. We're just... We enjoy comfortable silences, if you guys get the Pulp Fiction reference. Uh, And somebody posted a picture of one of the people who was killed. But it was a candid picture, you know. And they wrote this very beautiful, like, eulogy to them. And... In the photo, the person is smoking and there's a pack of American spirits, like a light green, which is the exact same pack cigarettes that my my partner smokes. And it was really hard to see that because it really brings it home. And I know I was relieved when I first heard, but like, it's just five of us are dead. You know? Hard. You know, and CNN like spins the john brown gun club like they're some kind of terrorist because when the queer community asked them to guard uh a um a drag queen uh library story time uh and the alt-right activists showed up with their guns and then they saw a whole bunch of people there standing with guns like you know what's cnn story cnn story is oh well now that Antifa is bringing weapons, things are going to escalate. Like, as if it's our fault for wanting to bring guns to a gunfight. The first gun control laws in the United States of America in the 1960s were passed because they wanted to get control of Black people. Mm -hmm. They wanted to stop the Black Panther Party. Yep from wielding weapons openly in the state of, in Oakland, which they could to protect their communities from racist murdering cops. Yep. Well, of course now too, like we just saw over the weekend, you had somebody take out two, you know, two power substations because they wanted to prevent a, uh, a drag queen, you know, a drag story time. And a whole bunch of that, people are without power. Exactly. So and probably medically fragile people died. Yes, maybe. So my background is also uh, emergency management and uh, specifically focused on national security. So I really hate the fact that I I look at things like that as being case studies when I have ties to, to the community, and it's like I hate the fact that I hate the fact that it becomes clinical for me. Because I'm trying to evaluate, okay, why was this occurring? What can we do to prevent it in the future? And that's ultimately why I'm in the degree program that I'm in, is I want to prevent instances like this. And whether that is, you know, creating resiliency for the communities or whatever that is, 
Like it, I, I don't understand how people can, in the pursuit of, of attacking something that's different or the, the other, so to speak, that they've harmed so many innocents. I do not understand that. Well, until, until the government decides to start calling people what they are, which are terrorists, and uh, addressing the problem like they do other problems, yeah, this is going to continue. Like, it, you know, terrorism as a legal term, they're not going to do that. Well, they, they, they but actually, look, they have. Let, uh, I mean, I, I, I hear you, <laughs> but like, let's think about the the Bush years. Well, right? so, let's, let's and let think Nina about, finish her statement, though. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Take take the legal terms out. That's fine. Mm -hmm. But until, uh, be, but you're right. The government has specific legal terms, mm -hmm. and we were. I was just talking about that with my partner the other day. Is that the media, right, has to be also be careful because they don't want to be sued for slander. But until we take this seriously, the 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 prosecuting hate crimes in uh, as a federal uh, uh, crime, you know, uh, it, Emmett Till is the reason why we now have that. And how many years has it been since that yeah. child's death until yeah. until hate crimes became a thing? Like we can't afford this shit anymore. Mm -hmm. And it, I am like done. So one of my bi biggest triggers is the, like when a person of color is in the news, there tends to be the, uh, and here's their background. Yep. Let's, take, let's take George mm -hmm. Floyd, right? We're going to look through their background to explain this, but when it's a white person or, you know, any other, any other dominant culture, there must be some mental illness mm -hmm. until all of this changes. Like, yeah, I'll step back. I, I, I had to tell a white person to their face, I'm so sorry. Last time I checked, uh, having a counterfeit $20 bill isn't the death penalty. And then they were like, oh, wait, you're right. And I'm like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't, like, I had to say it doesn't matter four times. Um, and then I had to end it with last time I, you know, the counter, because they, why people think it matters and it doesn't. I don't know why they think it matters. They don't think it matters. There is no. a reluctance to vilify white people and there is mm -hmm. an eagerness to vilify people of color. They don't oh. think it matters. They know it doesn't matter. But if it's not white people's fault, then it's yep. our fault. We yep. could have prevented it. If only we were better, if only we fit into society better, if only we pushed less, if only we didn't break the law, it's our fault. And that allows mm -hmm. the community at large to not take any accountability. Yeah. yeah, if we just don't go into Pierre, we don't get shot. You must comply. <laughs> you must right. comply. Even the person mm -hmm. who's in their own home. Who's the being person asleep in their killed. beds. Yeah, mm. asleep in their beds. You must comply. You must have done something. There has to be a reason for this. Yeah, I so I mentioned I used to be a 911 dispatcher. So the Monday morning after George Floyd got killed, my supervisor came in because she wanted to check on how my mental health was. Bear in mind, I was the only person of color on my team. So there's that. But she comes in and we're talking and she's like, I'm like, you really don't want to engage in this conversation with me. One, it's towards the end of the night and I'm exhausted. But... I am basically having to talk to this Karen about the fact that I'm angry that I can't go protest, even though I want with every fiber of my being to be out there marching. Because if I, like I said earlier, if I get arrested, I lose my job. But also bringing up the what about is, oh, what about the, you know, it, it, and I, I had to look at her and go, did you watch the video? Because I have. There is no reason that man should have been killed. None. But to pull off the what about is of well, what about the black criminal who like shot at a white cop because he was leading a warrant? That's a completely different situation. 
somebody that's fleeing there's a lot of wrapped up there's a lot of stuff wrapped up with like response to that but regardless it's like no no just no you there is no there is no justification for that and that's why stories such as you know stories about uh trans people of color get buried um especially when we're talking about uh you know using well so again it's difficult trying to help people understand being transgender is not a mental illness that anybody can have a mental illness but they are not mutually uh one one can occur without the other right like mental illness can affect anyone but there's still this stigma of well it wasn't a hate crime. This person was mentally ill and probably did something. So we still, it's like so pervasive in the communities that they continue not to be addressed. And we continue to see the high numbers of deaths that we do because nobody's really talking about the issues. Yep. Like, look at the, ugh. There's no logic in it. I've pointed out many times. I'm like, you don't see very many people of color walking into the white spaces that have wronged them and going on shooting sprees. Right. This just doesn't happen at this. I mean, mm -mm. there is a social problem that empowers these people to feel like they can take action mm -hmm. and be martyred for it. Mm -hmm. And it happens. And I don't yeah. understand how people don't connect that, like, you know, they're innocent, racist little Facebook memes. They're, they're mm -hmm. shitty comments while they're out and about. All of those things are what contribute to a climate that lets people pick up guns and walk into queer nightclubs and murder people. Mm -hmm. and so I mean, I don't accept that normalizing the behavior is a lesser crime yeah to to pick up that uh, uh that thread for i'm i'm hoping that most people are aware the uh, department of homeland security has put out notices that uh lgbtqia2s plus uh communities of color and uh specifically people who are of the jewish faith are under attack right now and so yeah, still yeah, I should say still, it never, it is prominent, is prominent, no, because it's always been there, but however you want to say it, they actually issued a statement, which to my knowledge has never been done before, but what, yeah. what as, as panel members, as stadiums, as people sitting at intersectionality, what can, how can our community help each other heal, how can the SEA start to actually, I don't know if we have anything for the SEA. I, you know, folks like Jessica and Gigi and everyone who's been doing the work has been doing what they can, but what comes next? Or what can viewers do to support these communities that are constantly facing harm? Hmm. Um, just my opinion, uh, participate in mutual aid, uh, start forming, um, uh, start forming groups, uh, and start having it be off the books, not online and start writing ledgers, uh, pulling queer art and books and things. Um, and if you are comfortable with that uh, and you uh, are in a environment that, and is willing to go through the training, get a gun. I know that there are a lot of people in leftist spaces and brown leftist spaces that are, you know, very pro gun control. But at this point, like, they're not playing by the rules. Why should we? Mm 
Um, I'm going to speak to the, not just the SCA a little bit, but like in general, um, people don't make space for people to speak. They, they think they do. They think they create opportunities, but they rarely do. They usually dominate conversations with their own viewpoints, things that they've heard, things that they're repeating from people of color, from queer folks. Um, people need to make space for people of color and for people who are queer and people who have their own voices and can speak for themselves. Um, and then that needs to be taken seriously. Uh, Nina knows this, a lot of people who are very close to me know this, um, but I had a lot of issues with the SCA board. Um, mm -hmm. And I am not the DEI officer right now. And that was not by my choice. There is no DEI officer right now. Part of that was the problematic relationship that I had. And like, I plan on talking about that more. Now is not the time. But I think it says something when the corporate DEI officer of an, of an organization feels excluded. Mm -hmm. I, I think that that's a problem. And I think it speaks to the performativity of making space, but not really, right? Here's this position. We're going to put you in it we are not going to act on your suggestions. We are not going to put forward the things that you want to move forward. Um, there's a lot of issues with that. And I think it stems from the idea that we're saying things people don't wanna hear. They're hard. They involve taking a very hard reflection at yourself and going, I've been part of the problem. Mm -hmm. And it's work. And, mm -hmm. and we're asking people to do a tiny percentage of the work that we do all of the time. And there are times I think when people are mobilized to do it and unpopular opinion, I hate those. I hate that we see peaks in activism after a terrible event because all it makes me think is how many more people have to die before this is a lasting thing for everyone? How many times do I have to point to something and go, see, look, you should care before people care in a way that creates lasting change? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things I had discussed last fall with somebody, um, one of the things I've been personally doing is I've been doing research on basically the Gullah Geechee and like they're, first of all, they are, they are a living culture, one, but two, their journey over from Africa, you know, being brought over to Africa and then creating their community because steeped in resilience. But I had done a class specifically about their food ways as resilience. And I had a, I had a peer ask me, what can I do to be a better ally? And one of the things that the West has given us specifically in their admonitions to their peers, is to know when to speak and to be silent. Specifically in terms of being an ally, like jean and what Jess has said and everyone else has said, shut up and let the minority speak. Let us tell you what we need. And then create that space so that our needs, our voices can be amplified. Do the work. Like mm -hmm. Jess said, I've seen that too, where it's been like, well, I'm the only white, I'm the only black person in an all white space at an event. And it does, it, it definitely fosters that feeling of ex exclusion, despite the fact that people are trying to welcome me into that space. But it's the whole, okay, are you just going to welcome me into the space as a fighter? Or are you welcoming me into the space as a whole person? Because you may not necessarily like what I'm going to have to say, depending on what conversation gets started. Here. I think that there's a lot of a lot of need for us to check in with each other. And I think if y'all say you're our allies, have you checked in with us? Mm-hmm. 
Um, there's so much and it's so heavy. And so one of the things that I do is I'm a disaster chaplain. And we talk about oh. how you can hold up a glass of water for a couple minutes and it doesn't feel like nothing. Four mm-hmm. hours later, your arm's falling off. Mm-hmm. And so every little thing on us, any moment we can put it down is so essential to our literal survival. Let's let's look mm-hmm. back at the medical stuff that we know. Yeah. And if we don't care for ourselves and care for each other, we will not be there for the next generation. Mm-hmm. We have to keep our survival. I think the the one thing I'm going to say is because we end every show talking about how allies can can be there for us. Um, watch the show. There is information that is invaluable. This is a space, uh, especially for white people. This is an affinity space that you don't have opportunities to see. Mm -hmm. This is a unique experience that we are giving you both as insights into what it's like to be a person of color, what it's like to be in the SCA as a person of color. And if you truly wanna be an ally, you need to see us for people. You need to hear our stories. You need to see our faces. And, you know, if you're not doing that, then do that first because it's all here. I really want to thank all of you for being here tonight. It is so heavy and you can feel it. Um, I've actually felt it more tonight than, than some of the other episodes we've done, but, um, Thank you for coming into this space, sharing your experiences, being vulnerable. Uh, I know that there are other people of color who are watching, who are feeling validated. I mean, we're seeing it in the comments. Um, We have more and more viewers who are saying, yes, this is, we need this space. Um, And for me, I can personally say this is what's keeping me moving right now is this show. And, and folks like you who are willing to come on and, and share, uh, share with us. Um, for the next episode, it will be Gigi, Jessica, and I, and a special guest uh, recapping the you know, 2022 year and having some real talk about DEI and the SCI. Um, I really, highly encourage people to watch this episode. Um, There's going to be some hard truths. There's going to be a lot of difficult looking in the mirror. Uh, But if you want the work, if you want this, the society to truly change, then it needs to be out. Um, Because we can't do this anymore. This is, this is not the way to go about this. Um, so please join us on the the 20th back at our normal time, 6 PM for a special episode. Um, trust me, it'll be worth viewing. Thank you all for watching and we will see you next time.